Gentlemen, the, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, my friend, friend to Toby Glockner, who is an expert in accident reconstruction. So you get the opportunity now to hear from an expert who actually practices in this area. Um, you better take advantage and ask as many questions as, as you would like. Um, whether they are technical, that's how he does his work, and also how he has developed his practice. This is, this is an experience that uh, he is very experienced. He studied at UC Berkeley in what year did you graduate? 96. 96, okay. And um, he is, uh, I think, his PD license, and then he became an expert. In, testifies in court and helps the DA and helps other people to find out from the engineering point of view what actually happened. So I'm going to leave you with Toby and he will tell you very wonderful things today. So we have until 1.15? Oh, yeah. yeah, very good. All right, so we've got about 45 minutes today. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a glimpse in my life, what it is I do, how I've gotten to where I am, how profitable it is, because we're all thinking about uh, future earnings, aren't we? Uh, we're, we're looking at work schedules, we're looking at the type of people we work with, and you're all very interested in it, right? Uh, so thank you, Professor Granda, and uh, thanks for uh, coming. Um, I'm going to walk you through kind of who I am, where I came from, how I run my lectures, if you have a question, stop me right then, raise your hand. Okay, because chances are if you wait to the end, you'll forget. I may cover your question, but that's irrelevant. Ask it when it's in your mind. Okay, because chances are somebody else is thinking about the same question. This time is not about me telling you or preaching to you. This time is about you learning what I do. Because you've had this, we're, we're, we're three, three weeks away from the end of the semester, right? Um, I'm a graduate student now, so I know I just took my second midterm. Uh, so we're getting close to the end, okay? So you've been doing accident reconstruction. You've had great insight from Professor Granda into it, and now you get it from the grassroots. Uh, my boots are on the ground every day in this field, reconstructing accidents, dealing with lawyers. I say dealing because sometimes that's how it feels. Dealing with lawyers and, and earning money for the family. So let's uh, talk a little bit about who I am if uh, this works. Next slide. Do I have to turn it on, Professor? Oh. Um, did you do that or did I? I did. Uh-oh. You may uh, have a new job. <laughs> job. <laughs> so a little bit about who I am. I was a police officer for 15 years. I began investigating accidents in uh, 1984. I went through two police academies, two full -length police academies, I worked for the Sacramento Sheriff's Department, the Dixon Police Department, and finally the Oakland Police Department. I worked during the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, uh, my job as a crime scene investigator was to uh, recover bodies from the cypress structure. The cypress structure, uh, for those of you who remember the Loma Prieta earthquake, collapsed and trapped uh, many motorists between two levels of concrete deck, asphalt concrete deck. And my job was to go in with the search and rescue team and recover those victims. Then I worked in the Loma, or the uh, Oakland Hills fire in body recovery as well. Uh, and then while working as a police officer in Oakland, I went to numerous traffic accident investigation courses and then began reviewing accidents for the police department, some of which the police officers themselves were involved in. Uh, during that time period, I went to, you got to back up a slide, Professor. During that time period, I went to UC Berkeley, College of Engineering. I graduated uh, from Civil Structural. So uh, in 1996, I graduated. And then I sat for the PE exam. Um, I think it was about the year 99, because you're required to work with an engineer for two years, right? And then you get a couple of engineers who say, yes, Toby knows what he's doing. We'll go ahead and sign, and I can go sit for the exam. And then the Civil Structural, or the Civil exam, is two days, four parts. I don't know if the mechanical is the same way, because the civil guys have that extra earthquake part that they have to take. Uh, 
so I graduated uh, from UC Berkeley. I took the PE exam. Yes, it was very hard for those of you who are looking for it. How many of you have taken EIT so far? Uh, that's right around the corner for, for most of you, right? Uh, so it is a hard exam, but uh, certainly very uh, worthwhile. And of course, there, right below the, the thing I did skip, I am now a, a graduate student in the mechanical engineering department. I've taken 201 so far. For those of you familiar with classes this semester, I'm taking 202 and 209. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, I've just started, basically. But uh, as, as I tell my kids, uh, you're never too old to learn. There's always something more you can learn. And every day I come to class, I learn something new that uh, is directly applicable to what I do in my career. So a little more, uh, I am a, 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 um, accredited by the Accreditation Commission for Traffic Accident Reconstruction. This is the only organization in the world really that focuses specifically on accident reconstruction experts. Okay, So uh, we have this class here, and in fact, I think this is one of the few uh, universities that we actually have a vehicle safety or crash reconstruction course. Um, maybe at Northwestern on the East Coast, but out here in the West, this is one of the only ones. So uh, bottom line is there aren't a lot of programs in accident investigation and reconstruction. The closest we get is in mechanical engineering here, right? We can design the cars, we can build the cars, we can play with the race work, but there aren't a lot of courses on reconstructing a collision. Um, so ACTAR, okay, is an organization that's worldwide that has a test that's eight hours long, probably very much like the test you'll take at the end of this, where you'll be given a crash, and you'll be expected to develop, if you can, impact speed, speed changes, and maybe determine how the collision occurred. Right? That's what ACTAR does. Uh, there are many members of ACTAR that are not engineers. They're retired police officers without any engineering background. And then there are many who are engineers that uh, earn that credential. So bottom line, ACTAR is one of the only standing credentials for accident reconstruction experts. Uh, but there's also the Society of Automotive Engineers, which you're familiar with. But they don't require you to take a test to be a member of the uh, There's National Society of Professional Engineers, all of these organizations that I'm a member of too, but ACTAR is the only one that actually tests you to see if you can do this work. So uh, I also uh, am a past instructor at UC Riverside had an extension program where they had public safety and we taught accident reconstruction courses. It's not very interesting because I don't do it anymore. But what is very interesting that I engage in ongoing research. You guys like the word research, I'm sure. I certainly have enjoyed over the past um, so many years engaging in research. Our last research effort was to take full-size vehicles, design a pulley mechanism, pulley mechanism, and propel those cars underneath the side of the center. And then we use 3D scanners to scan the change in volume as a result of going under the center trailer and to establish mathematical models that will enable us to reconstruct these types of accidents. That's fun stuff. You know, you can get involved in that. So uh, I can tell you a little more about myself if you like, but given the, the time crunch, let's move on. This is not going to work, is it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, let's see. 18 years now, I've been doing this. 18 years. I was a cop for 15. Now I've been doing this for 18 years. By the time you retire, now I don't think so. There's a lot more to do and a lot more to learn about. Who are the consumers of accident reconstruction? Who is interested in what we have to do? Okay, uh, you design a part that fits in a copy machine. You know who the consumer is. It's pretty straightforward, right? Who's the consumer of accident reconstruction? Lawyers, maybe. Uh, insurance companies, people who are involved in litigation. Today, if you leave, and you're out here on Hornet and you make a left hand turn, you have a long left hand turn, and the light stays green, and sooner or later it's going to go red, and somebody just blows through the red and hits you. Right? Uh, you're going to make a claim to your insurance company, and your insurance company might turn around and call me and hire me to determine, if possible, the color of the light at the time of the collision. Why do they care? Well, obviously. They care because when the insurance companies determine who's at fault and decide whose policy is going to pay for the damages, they need somebody like an accident reconstruction expert to do that. Okay, that's how we more often than not end up working for insurance companies. But I also work for public defenders, district attorneys who might have an assault with a deadly weapon uh, case where the, the instrument's the car. Maybe somebody tries to run down a police officer with a car, 
and they'll hire an accident investigation expert to reconstruct the collision. So uh, occasionally I'll work for district attorneys and public defenders, uh, plaintiff attorneys. We work for both plaintiff attorneys and defense attorneys involved in litigation. Uh, once a lawsuit has been filed, your insurance company will have a lawyer that will work on the case to represent you, the involved party, and then there will be a lawyer that represents the party on the other side. And then, of course, they engage in moral battle to determine who's at fault for the collision. Oftentimes, they'll turn to a reconstruction expert to help them decide. Um, the uh, other parties that are interested in accident reconstruction, obviously, is the government, the federal government, NHTSA, the National uh, Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration, has several different programs that are interested in accident reconstruction methodologies. The new car assessment program, where cars are crash tested to ensure that before they make it to the consumer, the vehicle's safe. We, you're, you're all familiar with crumple zones, uh, zones of impact on the front of the vehicle that will reduce the overall acceleration that the occupants are exposed to during the crash. The federal government is very interested in that. And we have uh, two different programs at the federal level, SIREN and FARS. It keeps track of accidents that are occurring. And then, of course, at the state level, the Office of Traffic Safety. If you look at the Office of Traffic Safety website, you'll find that there are opportunities for um, research that the state of California finds. The most recent one, which you're all probably familiar with, how many of you ride motorcycles? Okay, you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> Recently, the Office of Traffic Safety sponsored a, uh, a research study for lane sharing. You all know that lane sharing now is legal in the state of California. That's based on a research grant that was administered by uh, UC Berkeley, but funded by the Office of Traffic Safety. And there are countless other uh, types of research grants that are available that focus on traffic safety, timing of traffic signals, speeds on roadways, roundabouts. They're, they're popping up everywhere now. That's a result of some uh, research grants by the Office of Traffic Safety. Uh, and then finally, of course, the automobile manufacturers and vehicle safety researchers. Uh, I mean, that that's, you know, goes without saying. Obviously, Ford is interested in how their vehicles uh, perform in crash tests, particularly when the government gets a hold of them and does the new car assessment program. So these are our consumers. Question is, um, which ones of these do we typically work for? I, I left out, uh, by the way, fleet managers, which goes without saying, if you're running a police department, for example, and you're running the fleet, you've got hundreds of police cars, right? And you're interested in uh, the, the life expectancy of those cars, when they're involved in crashes, why the crashes occurred, are these crashes preventable, can they be avoided? And a lot of the police cars these days have event data recorders, which I'm sure we've talked about by this point. And we'll talk a little bit about event data recorders. Sorry, I can't change it on my own for you. Um, so, local accident reconstruction firms, how many are there, uh, people out there like me to do this? Well, let's say 18 years ago, there were very few. Now, 18 years later, there are engineering firms everywhere, it seems, in California in particular, that focus specifically on accident investigation and reconstruction. My firm's listed at the top. Um, if you're familiar with exponent failure analysis, I did some part-time work for them back in 1997. They're a very large worldwide firm that focuses on forensic engineering. Take a look at their website if you're looking for a job after graduation. They post all of their open positions. Um, Boster Kobayashi in the East Bay in Pleasanton is another firm that and I've given you the website references. Rimkus Engineering or Consulting is also another firm that uh, hires people right out of school looking for work. To work in this industry. Uh, so what would you expect maybe to earn? Any idea in this business? Typically, accident reconstruction experts bill themselves to a client by the hour. Uh, so I started off back, uh, I guess, in year 99, billing about 200, and now my bill rate's about 275 an hour. So that's what the client pays me per hour, and of course we have overhead that we have to run. I have an assist that we have to pay. We have an office we have to you know, pay the rent on. But the hourly rate for this type of work is actually pretty good. Uh, and that's for somebody who is uh, at the bachelor's level. That's pretty good. So it's something to think about. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, I have some resources for those of you who are interested. I think Professor Granda 
we'll have this available to you. You can take a look at these different websites and take a look at the jobs that are available, the pay scales that are available, if this is an area where you think you might want to continue on. Next slide, sir. All right, so you've seen this, I'm sure. You've looked at the uh, Lynn Fricky book, right? At some point in time or another. And uh, I am asked every single time I testify. Um, and uh, one of the very first questions the lawyers ask me is, what is accident reconstruction? And I tell them it's really the process of taking information that's available after the collision has occurred, which might be what? Skid marks, the length of the skid marks, vehicle damage, crush depth, right? Uh, and now in the last 10 years, event data recorders, you know, we, we start cropping at the mouth and we find out, oh, the car's had an event data recorder. We can download the event data recorder, right? So all of this information is available after an accident has happened. And your job as the reconstruction expert is to put it all together and make sense of it. And as you know, as being engineers, you don't just look at one facet of the evidence. You look at all of it and look at the big picture that it paints, okay? So this is one of the very first questions I answer when I testify. Uh, next slide. All right. What is a typical accident reconstruction? Um, let's see. Have you done hypotheticals in the class? What, what kind of questions would you ask a reconstruction expert? How fast the car was going, right? That's an obvious one. So you've got uh, a pedestrian struck in a residential zone. What's the speed limit in a residential zone? 25, right? So what if you do a calculation based on a head throw distance? Are there methodologies to do that or to calculate the speed of the vehicle based on how far a head is thrown? Absolutely. Not just the simple projectile motion equation, but there are other equations that are empirical based on crash testing that work very well for pedestrians. So you go and you do the calculation to find out that the motorist is going 50 in a 25. That's bad news, right? Okay, this is the type of question you might be asked to answer. Uh, another one was whether or not that pedestrian was visible. During the day, it's usually pretty easy to see the pedestrians, okay, unless they're wearing camouflage or something. But during the night, it's often very difficult. So an accident reconstruction expert may take uh, high-end video cameras out at night using the actual involved vehicle's headlights and a pedestrian wearing the same type of clothing and, do, and then do what we call a time versus position study. So in one second, if a pedestrian walks four feet, minus one second before the collision, they're four feet back, right? Two seconds, they're eight feet back, right? And we can do the same type of thing for the car and then by positioning the pedestrian in the car one, two, four seconds back, we can arrive at a determination whether that motorist had sufficient time to see the pedestrian and avoid the collision. And that is a question that is often asked with auto pedestrian uh, cases. Conservation of linear momentum, you've done this I'm sure now, okay? Uh, we um, used to rely a lot more on it, admittedly. As time has gone on with the event data recorder, we're relying less and less because a lot of times we get information directly from the vehicles. But uh, conservation of linear momentum works very well in our business in terms of calculating speed. You need the post-impact speeds, right? You need the impact angles, right? And the departure angles. Very simple application. The trick is finding the appropriate departure angle, isn't it? Sometimes it's not always very clear. You have to do a scale drawing and figure out what that departure angle is. Uh, another um, type of case that we might work on is a suspected product failure, whether or not an airbag, like the Takata airbags, perform the way they should, or um, um, a steering mechanism breaks in a car as a result of a collision. Uh, sometimes we're asked about uh, failures of uh, specific components. These are the types of questions we're often asked, and it goes in um, uh, hand in hand with red light green light. We're often asked about, can you tell the color of a traffic signal? How many of you can tell the color of a traffic signal beyond a reasonable doubt based on an investigation? It's actually very difficult to do, particularly with traffic actuated lights that sense the presence of vehicles through cameras, and then they change the color of the light. Sometimes it's very difficult to do. But these are the types of questions we're asked. All right, so let's start off with uh, probably a case study. Uh, the, the one thing I didn't show on the previous slide, because I have a case study here to show it, is uh, conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is what? The, the law of conservation of energy says energy is neither created or destroyed, right? In a, in a closed uh, system, it remains constant, right? So during an automobile collision, 
two vehicles may crush, each of them may uh, absorb energy. So the total energy of the system changes from kinetic energy initially, right? Each, assuming each vehicle is moving. Each vehicle has its own kinetic energy, so the sum total of energy can be calculated. That energy, once the vehicle's under rest, is transformed or been absorbed by vehicle damage and post-collision motion. So some of the methodologies that we use in terms of calculating damage energy are really very simple. Uh, this is uh, something that goes back to 1968 when Richard Amori first realized that, okay, we've got this, this structure and after a collision it crushes or the side of a vehicle crushes, there must be energy being absorbed there. Well, clearly there is, right? How can we quantify that energy? And uh, Richard Amori first proposed in 1968 that we could do it with a spring. And say we've got a spring constant and we've got deflection. Can we calculate the energy necessary to compress a spring at a given distance if we know the spring constant? Simple in our business, right? Very simple. Richard Amori started the wheels turning and applying that to vehicles, measuring the crush damage to the vehicle. If you could change the slide, sir. Measuring the total crush damage to the vehicle and coming up for a method with a methodology for calculating the amount of energy consumed by crushing the vehicle that distance. And this, this type of methodology, uh, what we call affectionately as crush, is, is very useful in our business because when it comes to conservation of momentum, let's say you, you're asked uh, by Professor Granda, and this is not a suggestion, but you're asked to reconstruct a collision and you have no skid marks. You go to an intersection, there are no skid marks. There are no gouges in the roadway. There's no video. There's no event data report. All you have are the damaged vehicles. Two vehicles crushed afterwards. Can you use conservation momentum to analyze that crash? It's going to be difficult, isn't it? Because you, don't, you, you might be able to estimate the impact angle because one driver may say, I was going due north. The other driver may say, Let's use the damage on this car. It was going due west. He struck me on the left side, right? So you might be able to estimate the intersection where these two vehicles collided. But coming up with a departure angle, angle is going to be next to impossible, isn't it? Because you really don't know where the vehicles came to rest without some information. What you can do, though, is you can measure the crush damage to the vehicles. You measure the crush damage to, in this case, the side of this vehicle. And the vehicle that struck it is bound to have damage on the front. And then we measure those two crush profiles, and we can come up with a total amount of damage energy. Very useful, isn't it? Now we can attribute that damage energy in the closed system to the kinetic energy of the two vehicles. It becomes a little difficult to figure out which vehicle had more kinetic energy pre crash, but at least we've got some total of energy, and from the damage we can calculate delta V of each of the vehicles. We know what delta V is, right? Delta V is the change in velocity that the vehicle experiences during the collision. And the change in velocity that a vehicle experiences during a collision is used, well, for many reasons, but two of the most common are what? Come on, I know we're all alive. What's the most common uh, use for speed change? Injury, assessing injury potential, whether somebody might have been injured in a collision. And delta V is also used to calibrate whether or not the airbag should be fall, isn't it? The speed change and acceleration are used to determine whether an airbag should be fall, okay? Those questions can be answered by crush, by looking at crush damage alone. Next slide, please. Let's see what else we have. So uh, as for sake of a hypothetical here, if we have the overall weight of the vehicle is uh, 3,527 pounds, we have the width of damage, uh, the overall width of the damage, and the overall length, and then we take some crush measurements. Uh, next slide, please. And then we use some uh, readily available equations. In this case, these are simple linear equations that use the, the maximum crush depth. We can estimate the impact speed of the vehicle when it's slid into the pole. These, uh, this formula here is a very simple, straightforward linear um, equation that is used to estimate the crush depth of the vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. And things can get a little more complex that we can start using what we refer to as the uh, damage ener energy equations. You might have seen those by now, where you take crush measurements along the side of the vehicle, input those measurements into what is referred to as, in this case, the six-point equation. Have you seen this equation before? Where you have crush depth along the side of the vehicle, and this is taking basically the average crush with uh, 
the interior points are weighted a little more heavily. And then from this equation, uh, we are calculating the total damage energy for the uh, collision and then estimating the impact speed right here in this lower corner. This is just a spreadsheet where the equations have been put in. You know all of these equations. You yourself could put them into the spreadsheet very easily. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, in the side impact, this is the damage energy equation. Once you have all of the crush measurements, you can calculate the total damage energy. And then if you recognize this equation here is equating basically the kinetic energy prior to the collision to the total damage energy. This methodology assumes that whatever kinetic energy the vehicle has at the time of the crash is converted entirely into damage energy, which isn't necessarily true, right? But for the, for the sake of reconstruction, the equations work actually very well. Next slide, please. This is a real uh, case that I investigated not long ago, and it's interesting because we have event data recorder data, okay? This vehicle here, uh, a rather large uh, Ford F-250 pickup, and I've uh, superimposed on here some of the data that came from the event data recorder. Now down here, right behind this uh, video, in the last half a second, thank you, sir, in the last half of a second or so, the vehicle, according to the event data reporter, was traveling 44 miles an hour. Huh, it's all over, right? We don't have anything left to do. Well, let's take a look and apply this now using some of our methodologies. But before we change the slide, let's take a look at this here for a minute. We have a, a total longitudinal um, delta V, or speed change, at the very top of 15.2 uh, miles an hour. Why is it negative? Because the vehicle's slowing, right? Then we have a total lateral delta V, of 3.12, and in this particular case, it is negative because the vehicle is being pushed as, as if we're driving it. Which way is this vehicle being pushed? Can you tell by the damage? What do you think? The car that this vehicle struck, I will tell you right up front, it was struck on the left side, okay? Look at this damage and tell me, as the accident reconstruction expert, which direction was this vehicle traveling um, when the Ford hit it, okay? So as if you're the driver of the Ford, is the vehicle coming from your right or coming from your left? From the right, okay? And what is it about the damage that tells you that? Well, take a look at this. Where's this where should this license plate be? Eek. Right here, right? Damage flow. A lot of times you can find this car in experienced accident reconstruction expert. Not only do we have the download, which is really cool, right? But we can also look at the damage and start to read the damage to figure out what happened in this collision. So looking at this vehicle, I knew immediately that whatever vehicle this one struck was coming from its right to left. Okay, so I'm thinking this vehicle's traveling down the roadway and somebody pulled out in front of it. Maybe from a stop sign on the side street that's on the right hand side, right? That makes sense because the lateral delta V here is negative 3.12 miles an hour. That means that whatever this truck hit pushed it to the left 3.12 miles per hour, right? Now, if we take those two delta Vs and resolve them in, uh, into the resultant, we can determine the actual delta V and its direction that this vehicle experienced during the collision. Mm -hmm. And that, that delta V should be the same. The resolved delta V should be in the direction of the principal direction of force applied to the vehicle, okay? Let's take a look at the next slide and, and see what it actually hit. Ah, here we go. So this vehicle is the Honda. This vehicle pulled out in front of the oncoming Ford and unfortunately the driver died instantly during this collision. The driver just didn't see the Ford coming and pulled out on the stop into its path when the collision occurred. Could we look at this? I haven't given you a great photo but when you start looking at the damage very, very closely here, you can pick out characteristics of the damage. It will also tell you which direction this vehicle was going in and out. Okay? So now we have damage for the two vehicles. I've measured the damage here. This uh, green line that goes all the way through, which is 23 degrees, was an estimate in the field of what I thought the PDOF was. You're familiar with PDOF, right? Mm -hmm. Principal direction of force applied to the vehicle during the collision. That whole Newton's, you know, third law thing, two forces equal and opposite, right? All right? 
So the two vehicles at their maximum engagement, the, the damage obviously fits together, not quite like a puzzle, they never fit perfectly. Why is that? What's that? Why do when you piece two vehicles together afterwards, like this Ford and this Honda, they're not going to fit together perfectly. Pretty close, but they're not going to fit together like a puzzle. Okay, why is that? Because during maximum engagement, the metal is pushed to a different position and then it bounces back a little bit. Okay, that's the restitution of the metal that occurs after the collision. But nonetheless, you were able to piece these two vehicles together. You've now figured out a lot of what happened combined with the event data recorder data. Now you've got delta V from the pickup truck, you've got damage to the two vehicles. So if we do a few calculations, can we uh, take a look at those, Professor? Uh, let's, let's flip over to the next slide. Let's get into, okay, so here we have just the parameters that are input into the calculations. Of course, uh, the crush depth, the overall crush depth of the vehicles, the location of the damage, and then we should have, uh, these are the associated energies calculated uh, based on that spreadsheet that I showed you uh, a minute ago. If we can flip over to the next one, hopefully I put that spreadsheet in there. There we go. All right. So let's just take a quick look at this. This is our Ford, and I've used what's called the two-point equation. You're familiar with the two-point equation, right? The two-point uh, damage energy equation. Can I get away with you just taking two crush measurements across the front of the Ford? Probably. It's pretty uniform. In the case of the Ford, the left side was pushed back what was it, 19 inches. C1 is always at the left front corner, right? And then you measure incrementing uh, towards the right side of the vehicle. So the left front, bottom line is the left front corner of the Ford was crushed in about 19 inches. That related to an overall damage energy of, where's my damage energy? Uh, right here, crush energy, 85,543 foot pounds. But I'm also interested in the crush force. This is the force that was exerted on the Ford to cause the damage, right? That same, that force must or should be equal to the force applied to the Honda, right? You don't want one to outweigh the other by twofold. Because according to Newton, and we want to make him happy, right? The third law says that the force should be equal between the two vehicles. So when we do the overall calculation, here's the damage, uh, the force exerted on the Honda during the collision. They're very, very close. 120, one, 124,000 pound, uh, pound force and 122,000 pound force, okay? So we've fulfilled that requirement, Newton's third law. Then finally, in this particular case, we look at, here's our Ford, okay? We start to look at the overall delta V for the Ford. This delta V here is in miles per hour, it's 20.07 miles per hour. What did we have for the longitudinal and the lateral? 15 and 3.12. So what if we square those, add them, and take the square root, what do we get? Um, it's very close, I'll tell you, so you don't have to whip out your calculator, so I don't see anybody going through the calculator. Uh, it's very close to 20 miles per hour. This is a damage energy approach that has been compared back to the event data recorder, bottom line. We have the event data recorder data, we've used the damage energy approach, and compared the two, and arrived at a consistency. I also did this particular crash using conservation of momentum too for a third approach, and all three approaches should come up with the same delta V for the involved vehicles. More often than not, the data we get from the event data recorders is being used for comparison to delta V. Does that make sense? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the, the overall approach? We download the vehicle, we get the data. We don't just call the attorney and say, here's the data. We go back to the desktop, we measure the crush depth of the two vehicles. We ensure that the vehicle's damage is respective of where the vehicles were coming from or where they were going to. And then we calculate the respective delta Vs and make sure that it's consistent with the data. Does that make sense? If you were involved in this crash, what would you want to know? You know if it was a loved one involved in the crash, what would you want to know? Why did he pull out? Good question. Were there any lines of sight obstruction at the, at the intersection that prevented these drivers from seeing each other? If there were, you got a question, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with this intersection? I will tell you that the, the thoroughfare that the Ford was on 
is a 55 mile an hour thoroughfare. So the lines of sight for that roadway should include three to four seconds of an oncoming vehicle visible if it's tra traveling 55, right? And there was. There were no lines of sight obstruction that would explain why the motorist pulled out. The motorist wasn't intoxicated. So why did this motorist pull out in front of the oncoming vehicle? We may never know precisely why, but uh, sometimes we're moving a little fast. How many of you have been traveling down the thoroughfare? Somebody stops for a fraction of a second, literally rolls it and pulls right out in front of you. They're just not looking long enough, are they? How long does it take for you to look at an oncoming vehicle and assess whether it's a hazard to you? It's not going to happen just like this. You're going to have to actually look at it for a second. You're going to have to see it moving relative to its background and assess its speed before you know really whether it's a hazard. So take that extra second to look. The next question that might be asked by the survivors of the occupants, you know, the occupants of the Honda is, did the driver of the truck really speed it? Well, the event data recorder says is the speed prior to, um, can we go back for a quick second? At the fear of running long, we'll just uh, delve a little deeper into this. One, uh, one more, right. Five seconds before the collision, the event data recorder says he's going 51 miles an hour. It's a 55 zone. It's not any indication that this motorist was speeding. There's not enough accident reconstruction tools for us to tell how fast he's going five seconds before the collision is set. What tool would you use? There's nothing. I mean, unless we have five seconds worth of skin marks, and that has happened, but it's huge much greater than this, of course. So we have to rely on the event data recorder for this. The next question that might be asked, could this driver have done anything differently? Was he inattentive? In other words, how long does it take the car to get out to the point of impact? That's what we refer to as the path intrusion time. It's the amount of time that passes while the path intrusion is occurring. That's the amount of time you as a motorist have. You've seen pedestrians crossing. They come from the other side of the roadway, and then they get to the median. You're driving along, and you're wondering, is that pedestrian going to keep walking? Right? You've got a long time to see that pedestrian and assess whether or not you should brake or accelerate. Brake, right? So. <laughs> And you've got the path intrusion time of that pedestrian is a long time. In this particular case, without running the fuel calculations, the Honda's path intrusion time is less than about two seconds. So if a motorist has one and a half seconds of perception response time, which is pretty typical, half of a second of braking, is it going to bring the Ford to a stop before the collision? Not likely. And in fact, we see in the data here that there was brake application and the Ford did slow. The motorist was paying attention and attempted to stop, but he was just too close. This is a very, very typical accident reconstruction. Starts off with the event data recorder. We measure the collision damage to the vehicles. I did these using a, a total station. Uh, now a lot of times we'll use a 3D scanner to measure the data. And then we might piece the vehicles together using the scan data for a trial exhibit. But really, uh, as an engineer, we're interested in the damage energy. So we calculate the damage energy. We, we ensure. Can we go to the next slide, Professor? Uh, 